we just want to show you as we speak to married couples today, and don't tune out if you're not married. Don't say, you know what, let me just turn off Facebook, YouTube, I'm out. Don't tune your mind out because there's something in this message that all of us can use in our relationship foundational principles that can help you with children and your relationships with your friends. So don't tune out, although we're speaking to married couples today. So as we go into the stimulation in our marriages as it is involving reconciliation or learning how to live together, how to get fruit out of our marriages, we want to first show you what is not stimulating. So why don't you watch the screen? I don't know. I, I don't know how many. Marriage is a binding contract, one that I do not intend to break. But that doesn't mean I have to like it or work on making it better. You know, they say that over 50% of communication is nonverbal. So that's why I just try to avoid communicating at all. When he comes home from a stressful day at work and I can tell he's upset, I find it best to throw all my anxieties and complaints on him, one after another. Boom, boom, boom. It's like some kind of a competition between us who works harder. It's a competition I intend to win. Whenever my wife and I get into a loud screaming match, I like to make sure that I scream loud enough for the kids to hear. In fact, sometimes I actually have them stand around and listen to us yell. They say that love will build a bridge, but love won't build a tunnel under his insecurities or fly an airplane over his lack of communication, or a rocket ship to avoid his bad breath in the morning. Some things love will never build. Marriage is a holy union, so that's why I'm married to my work as well as my iPhone. My husband and I struggle with our finances, but there is an entire struggling economy out there in need of stimulation. I charge more than I can afford for the good of this country. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. Well, you know what? Compliments don't help anyone either, and that's what they don't tell you. People think that marriage is like a big, delicious cake full of ingredients like love, commitment, communication, sacrifice. But love is more like a box of chocolates where most of the ones are really disgusting and make you want to vomit, and you didn't think there'd be so many when you first bought it. But sometimes you'll come across some that are fine, but don't count on it. Joy is something on Christmas morning, or when you're playing with puppies, or when you've just won the lottery. But joy in marriage? <laughs> is there peace in war? Is there honesty in politics? No one ever won something worth having without blood and tears. Marriage isn't built on compromise. It is conquered on the battlefield. According to the Bible, I'm the head of the house, and I get to make all the decisions my way, whenever I want and for whatever reason. And I don't understand why that makes her mad. Sometimes I don't get what I want. Simple. I just take away something that he wants. Honesty is rarely useful. I find that when I don't get my way, it's generally because I didn't lie effectively. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. No, <laughs> that doesn't apply to marriage. A little bit of laughter in there. there there's definitely some laughter in listening to this couple. But perhaps you're saying, you know, I see some of that in my marriage. I see some of that in my spouse. And like many of us, when we got married, whether it was you standing at an altar at a church or in a pastor's office or at the courthouse, wherever you got married in the park, that beautiful destination wedding, you were thinking of that person that you were marrying, all that they were going to do for you. Just how wonderful and grand life would be because of what they would bring into your life. And then after some time of kind of being with them, and getting over the honeymoon stage that most of us would say ends very quickly, you start to see things that may annoy you about them or they're not really the person you thought they were to get you to where you thought they would get you to, that they weren't born 
on earth for the purposes of fulfilling all of your wonderful dreams and plans. Well, as we started this series on stimulation, it was built upon Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, that says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And as we're talking about stimulation, we looked at stimulating in our relationship with the Lord, the stimulation, what does it look like to seek the Lord? Last week, we looked at what is stimulation as it concerns reconciliation in relationships and have, helping a brother or sister who has fallen into sin. And today, as we look at marriage relationships, what does it look like biblically for us to stimulate one another? What does that look like in our relationships day to day? And again, I encourage you, don't check out, just listen, because if you're saying, you know what, I'm not married, I'm divorced, I'm separated, or you know what, I'm not married, I have no desire to be married, one thing you are definitely called to do is to pray for marriages. All of us are called to pray for marriages. We see married people all around us, and here it is, you have a wonderful opportunity because this is a part of God's plan. Marriage is God's idea. It is his plan, and he said it is good. It was good, and it is good. In Genesis chapter 2, let's read that. Genesis chapter 2, we'll start at verses 18 through 25. It says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. There is this word that you have seen in Genesis chapter 2, these verses that we have read. That word is comparable. It says that he will give him a helper, one who is comparable to him, a helper. Now, when we see this word helper, I've talked to some women before, and they've gotten offended by the word helper because of the connotation of where we see it or how we see it in our culture. But this is a deep biblical word when he says, I will give him a helper comparable to him. And perhaps understanding the word helper will help us in our marriages today as we value the spouse that God has given us. Because helper is not in some ways where some of you have children or the child wants to help you do something. And so whether it's something in the kitchen, whether it's working on a car or doing a project at home, how many of you have had a kid, one of your kids say, can I help you? And then what we do sometimes with children, we will let them help us by giving them some minuscule task to do, knowing that they really aren't helping us, but we're just trying to appease them and keep them out of our way. Well, that is not what the Lord means by giving Adam a helper, someone comparable to him. The Lord meant for Adam and Eve together to fulfill a purpose, to fulfill a destiny, to fulfill the call, to have dominion, be fruitful, and multiply. And how many of us believe in this house today that that is still the purpose that God has for marriages today? Amen? So I'm just going to say as a woman standing here, when you look at your wife and you know that she's your helper, you better say, I got a good helper. Come on, women. Amen. You got a good helper. And, and here's the beauty of the word helper. I want you to understand the depth of it biblically. Listen to some of these verses and some will appear on the screen. God himself is our helper. How many of us have called on God to help? And we've just said the word help. Because we believe that he has what it takes to show up and help us. 
Well, Deuteronomy chapter 33 and 26 says, There is none like the God of Israel who rides the heavens to your help and through the skies in his majesty. Psalms 33 and 20 says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. For our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Psalm 124 and 8 says, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. Isaiah 41 and 10 that many of us often quote says, Fear not for I am with you. Don't be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You better start saying you got a good help. Hebrews 13 and 6 says, So we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And then Hebrews 4 and 6 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. The last verse I want to read for the help is one, Psalm 121 and 1 says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So when he said in Genesis chapter 2, I will give Adam a helper comparable to him, he meant for the two of them to come together and to have dominion, be fruitful and multiply. Let me stimulate us in our thinking of how we walk through this in our relationships together. And I know oftentimes when we, we read Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, we rush to Genesis chapter 3 because it's the fall. But I want us to think in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 with God's creation, he said that it was what? It was good. And it's still good. I know the fall came, and, but he didn't change his mind. And what we've allowed to happen out of that contention, that strife that we see that took place in Genesis chapter 3 with the fall, we miss seeing that God, though there were consequences, he still covered them. And he made a way of redemption that Jesus Christ would come and that you and I can still live out the plan and purpose that he had for our lives. I want to challenge us today because for us as believers, what we have allowed to happen a lot of times is negative talk to come in about marriage. We'll sit around people who talk negatively about marriage. And if I were to take a survey and ask you how many of you have actually grown up seeing positive marriages, perhaps many of us would not be able to raise our hand, but we need to believe today in the power of God that it is possible. And yes, we can live it out. We've got to start showing our young people this. We've got to start showing them that in the midst, yes, there will be struggle. There's two people trying to become one. And as my husband says, that is the hardest thing we will ever do, two trying to become one. But we've got to start teaching our young people that it is possible. And God wants you to honor him when you're with the spouse. God wants them, you to honor him with marriage. But we've allowed, allowed compromises in our choices. We have a generation that I talk to many young people in their 30s that, that are, they have a fear of committing to marriage. You know, we have this thing, let me tell you, marriage is not like a car. You don't test drive it first. But we have this mentality in our society that it's okay to test drive first. And that is not the will of God. We have this mentality that we, now we hear people with the verbiage, it's just a piece of paper. Well, if it's just a piece of paper and you sign off on it, why does it take you so long to get out of it? It's not a piece of paper. It's a commitment. And then we have this mentality now where it says marriage is between any two people who love one another, and that is not the plan and the purpose of God. So what God did was good, and it is still good. So before you mumble under your breath and you put in that comment section that, well, I'm not married to Adam and I'm not married to Eve. My marriage is not like that. It's, times are harder. Things are different. We don't live in the garden. We don't have just fruit at our disposal. We, we don't live like that. Well, I'm going to tell you again, it's the same God who gives us the power and the strength. John 14, 16 says to us, he says, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of every believer and you and I have to ask ourselves, are we submitting to him in our marriages? 
So I have to ask you a question before we go into our first point. I know that was a whole a lot of a setup here, but I need your mind locked in as we share these principles with you because today in this room, some of us are going to need to make some changes in how we relate to our spouse. Some of us are going to need to make some changes in how we speak to our spouse. Some of us are going to need to make some changes in how we serve our spouse. Some of us are going to need to make some changes in how we see marriage. So let me ask you a question. How do you see your spouse? When you see your spouse, is, is it that you see them as somebody you're just tolerating? Because God did not put you with someone for you to be tolerated, nor for you just to tolerate them. Is it that when they drive up in the driveway, you go, oh, man, they're home. But when that key comes in the door, it's like, oh, man, she's here. No, it's not about tolerating. God wants glory out of our relationships. He wants us to also enjoy one another. That's why this is not about toleration. Y'all getting quiet, but I'm going to keep on going. So how do we move forward in this beautiful institution of marriage, experiencing all that God desires for us? The first way that we're going to move forward is our first point is preference. We're going to need to prefer one another. We're going to stimulate our marriage through preference. I need to prefer my spouse. My husband always says this to me. If, if you got somebody in the house and uh, you're always happy, you can guarantee that other person is miserable. If you're always getting your way, you don't have to ask. They're miserable. Because we're supposed to prefer one another. That means that there is some sacrifice there. And there is this word, humility, that you and I need to have humil humility. No one is born with this character trait. No one is born with this character trait. It is not innate. And no one is humble all the time. This is a choice that you and I have to make. C.S. Lewis makes this comment. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. This is not walking around saying, I'm just a nobody. No, you are somebody. You are God's child. It's not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. And many of us wake up in the morning, the first person on our mind is who? Me. Me, 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 what I need, me. Humility, Andrew Murray, puts it, Andrew Murray puts it this way. Humility, the place of entire dependence on God, is the first duty and the highest virtue of the creature and the root of every virtue. And so pride, or the loss of humility, is the root of every sin and evil. James chapter 4 tells us how pride promotes strife but how humility brings the blessing of God. Can we agree that in our relationships that we need humility? We need humility. We need to prefer one another. We need to be humble. I want you to listen to what one couple says about humility in their marriage. They were asked about, well, if humility is needed in your marriage, how is it that the two of you walk in humility? They had been married some 40 years. And in an interview, someone sitting and interviewing them, they began to talk about humility, and the husband said, it means that you are not, that it means that you are willing to put others ahead of yourself. Not building yourself up, especially at the expense of others. He then echoed, I think humility is putting the other person first. It is being willing to do things for people without expecting something in return. His wife echoed that. She said, you got to be willing to do something without expecting a return. And how many times in our relationship we do something expecting a return? And then whatever is in our head that is not returned unto us, can we admit that sometimes we say, well, I know what I'm going to do next time? It's not being a martyr. It's not a woe is me. It does not mean that people can push you around. And it does not mean that you become someone's doormat. Oh, what beautiful marriages we could have if we could learn to prefer one another and walk in humility in our marriage. Well, I got to rush on because my husband's got some points to make and he knows I can go on and on. So let me wrap it up. So <laughs> in this place of walking in humility in our marriages, preferring him over myself. We're going to see the blessing of God. To, to, be, to not walk in selfishness, to really genuinely care 
and know that God gets the glory out of it. And in that, two really do become one in ways that you and I could have never imagined. So here it is. If you're going to walk in humility, and I gave you these last week, so I won't reiterate on them, but it is that if you're going to stimulate and walk in humility, then it's not to ignore what your spouse has done to you. It's, it's, this is not a doormat. This is not condoning sinful behavior. Uh, it's not to condemn your spouse either, and it's not to destroy them. You're not trying to destroy them. You want to build them up. If two are one, why in the world would I want to destroy the person that I'm trying to become one with? Why would I want him to feel condemned and I'm trying to become one with them? No. It's not condoning. It's not exposing. I don't want to expose. I'm not trying to make him feel bad about who he is or what he did. No, that's not it. We don't want to isolate. It's not to make the person feel isolated, but it's to becoming one. How do I walk with you through this? And then you heard it's not to uplift and devalue. It's not so see me how great I am for you. You totally need me. No, that, that's not helping. But if I'm going to stimulate in my marriage, it is, first of all, to walk in the humility that you just heard me talk about and to let the love of Christ dwell in our hearts, the love of Christ. And there are times, let me just say this, there are times, I can say even in my marriage, there is more love of Christ in him than it is in me, maybe because of something I'm going through. It, it, it's times that probably there's more love of Christ in me than in, in him. But it's the love of Christ that draws us together. And sometimes one is more loving than the other. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. It is the fruit of the spirit that we need that we read about in Galatians chapter 5, that kindness, that gentleness. Isn't it just absolutely just something crazy? And this just came to me. We can be kinder to the person we don't know than to the person in the house with us. And you come to church and they think, oh, they are just wonderful and grand. They're so nice and the spouse is looking. You talking about? <laughs> it should start in our homes first. We got to have genuine concern for one another. A spirituality and maturity is what we need. Understanding of God's grace. Knowing that we're going to glorify God and then we are unified. Let me wrap with this. Listen, when they, they walked away from this couple interviewing them, they asked them, well, then what do you do? How do you walk in this humility? And they said, you know what? We acknowledge one another's weaknesses and strengths. We acknowledge that in some ways he's stronger and, and I'm weak over here. Let me just tell you, any woman who's heard me teach or any woman who's in my life knows that cooking is not something I ever want to do. I could care less about an egg or a pancake. I don't want to. Some of you are chefs and that's great. Some of you enjoy it. I don't care about the spice. Have fun with it. It is not my strength. But in my house, I got a chef. And I'm grateful for it. I'm totally thankful. I sit down with Thanksgiving. I do not complain. I sit down with great joy. I'll say, do you need any help? He says, no, I even got the dishes. I say, praise the Lord and go on about my business. That doesn't devalue me. That's just not my strength. I have another strength that helps him. Look, it's not about sitting up comparing and competing. Can we stop that? We put it, they say we put each other first. We accept advice from each other. Look, if you're married to somebody and you can't accept their, your, their advice, you need to do a check because the one person's advice I should be able to accept is my spouse's. It's admitting when you're wrong. Not being proud, just say, I'm wrong. Offering and accepting forgiveness. Not gloating or criticizing. It's two becoming one. God said that it was good, and it is good. It is good. And so the next way that you and I learn that is that we've got to learn to stimulate one another through praise and affirmation. Thank you, honey. <laughs> So how do we stimulate one another? We, we've just heard many, many examples of how we prefer one another. And my point today is this. We will stimulate our marriages through praise. Stimulate our marriages through praise. In Philippians 4, verse number 8, the message renders it this way. Summing it all up, friends, I'd say you do your best by fulfilling your minds and meditating or speaking on things that are true noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best. 
not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to be praised, not things to curse. And I'd like to change that and not meditate, but to speak those things that are gracious, those things that build up. Words in a marriage are powerful. Words matter, especially in a marriage. You remember how it used to be. Remember when you met her or you met him. When you, when you would weigh every word, every action, everything you wanted to be just right, you were careful. Some things you would even rehearse how you would say them just to make sure you said it right. Can I get a witness? You would bring a friend in and say, hey, I'm thinking about saying this. How should I say it? Because you were wanted to be careful because you're building something. You're hoping something will come out, reciprocated out of the words that you were sold into a brand new relationship. Remember that? You were stimulated. Then you got married. <laughs> the mission has been accomplished. The honeymoon is over. And now we don't, we're not intentional, but we have become comfortable in our communication. And we can be careless in our words and our actions, and sometimes inadvertently we can hurt one another. I would submit to you today, brothers and sisters, that if we're married today, our conversations cannot be on autopilot, but we must be intentional about the words. Inch by inch, word by word, day by day, our marital, verbal relationship can easily erode to just talking about the news of the day. And there's enough news of the day to talk about all day. Or it can erode to the point that all you talk about would be the children and what's happening in their lives. Or work dynamics or extended family dynamic and leave no time for caring, intentional words for one another. The bad news is... All marriages go through dry seasons in conversation. The good news is God can redeem our conversations. And our prayer today is that we will be stimulated in our conversations with, with one another. Over time, we pay less attention to our spouse and, and less, less attention to our spouse and more attention to the things around them and not intentionally speak words into their lives just as we did when we were dating or courting. I like the way somebody worded it this way, I show I care by staying aware. I show I care for my marriage by staying aware of my conversation in my marriage. Please understand, brothers and sisters, and our marriage is going to grow. We've got to keep paying attention to one another, sowing good seeds, seeds into our marriage through our words. We've got to pay attention. We've got to speak words that affirm, words that confirm, into our marriage. Yes, she knows you love her because you come home, but she needs to hear you love her out of your mouth and vice versa because words are powerful. We all know how negative words happen in our marriage. You can remember what was said. You can remember how they said it. You can remember the action even before they said it, after, after they said it, even leading up to it. Why? Because if you heard a, a hard word in your, in your marriage, you can remember it, and it stays around a long time. Can I get a witness? Yes, it does. And brothers and sisters, just like that word can, can stay around, positive words can stay around as well. Nothing affects our marriages more than the words that we speak. And our words ring true in their, in their ears, brothers and sisters, and we must stimulate our marriage through our conversation. I'll give you a real-life example. You know, I love working with my wife, and it's fun. We have fun. And I, and I, I joke a lot, and so uh, a lot of times while we're at work and something's really big that has to be done, and, or maybe there's some big boxes that be moved, and the joke around... And I would say, hey, let me go get Tara. She can get it done. Or if there's something that has hard to be done, my joke is, let me go get my wife. Let me, she can get it done. And it was a joke. It's always a joke because I'm just playing around. But then I, I, I began to hear other people say the same thing about my wife. And it didn't sound funny anymore. As a matter of fact, I got defensive. Well, no, let your wife do it. <laughs> but what I found out, I had to own by me speaking that way, I gave somebody else permission to speak that way. And the question for you today is, who are you giving permission to speak negative about your spouse? 
Are, are you giving your children permission to speak negative about their mother? Because of what you say about her when she's, not, she's always late, she's blah, blah, blah. Are you giving your children permission to speak negative about their father? He's, he, you know, he's never on time. He's so inattentive. Oh, my God, here he comes. And watch this. And if you listen to them, they are going to replicate what they've heard. Why? Because you've given them permission. You said it's okay to talk about my spouse this way. Brothers and sisters, today, we're going to give you a challenge. First of all, it is your responsibility to protect your spouse with the words that people say about your spouse. Amen. You should not allow your child to say anything negative about your wife or your husband. You should not allow your sibling, your mother, your father. I know what, I'm talking about mother-in-law and father-in-law. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you should not let them, anyone, speak negative about yours. And it's your responsibility to make sure you, tell, you don't have permission to talk about my spouse like that ever. And everybody said amen on that. Amen. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, I want to challenge you today. And we're going to have some challenges at the end. Here's the first challenge I'm going to throw out to you. I'm going to challenge you for the next 30 days, every day, to look at your marriage, look at your spouse, and sincerely give them a compliment two times a day. And I, was, I know somebody's going to fall out. Two times a day, i got to say something nice. <laughs> Just the next 30 days. Watch this. And if you have children, one thing you say positive to them privately, and the second thing you say positive every day about them publicly so that they can hear you publicly praise your spouse. 30 days. Just two things. You can text one of them, okay? I'm going to give you a pass on that, okay? <laughs> you can text it to him or her. But if you're married, you need to make sure your children hear you for the next 30 days say something positive about your spouse and watch your household change. And watch their opinion of marriage change. And watch, you'll do this 30 days and find yourself doing 60 days, 90 days. And watch the light of love go brighter in your marriage. Here's a question for you. When was the last time you thanked your spouse and somebody would say, for what? They should be thanking me. Is that what you're thinking right now? <laughs> when was the last time you just publicly looked them sincerely in the eye and say, thank you? You may think that it's really easy to live with you, but you'd be surprised at just how hard it might be to live with you. <laughs> and the person that has made a commitment to live with you until your last breath is a person you should be so thankful for. If 2020 hasn't taught us anything, we should never take our marital relationships for granted. And everybody said amen on that. One diagnosis can change your household forever. Do you understand that? Brothers and sisters, you should thank them. You, you can say things. I see your commitment to us and the family, and it means so much. And I, want, I don't say it enough, but I will say it more. Thank you for everything you do. You'd be surprised at what that will do. Here's a quote for you. Having a thankful heart and attitude towards our spouse is one of the most effective means of having a tongue of life. But when we are thankful, we will be quick to praise and to thank our spouse and build them up with our words. Having a thankful heart, however, could mean an attitude shift on our part. What often happens in marriages is that we begin to take the positive aspects of our spouses for granted. You know, those aspects that make you want to marry him or her first in the first place and focus instead on the negative aspects. Having a thankful heart will mean looking for the good in your spouse, focusing on the ways in which they are a blessing to you, and thanking them for that. If your spouse is here, why waste this moment? Look them, keep your mask on. <laughs> but look at them and tell them thank you. Go ahead and do it right now. You can do that right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's healthy. <laughs> thank you. That's healthy. Second point today is this, or third point today is this. We're going to stimulate our marriages through passion. Stimulate our marriages through passion. 
Revelation 2, 4 through 5 says this, the New Living says this, but I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or as each of us, each, each other as you did at first. Let me say it again. I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. Of course, this is Jesus uh, uh, confronting the church in Revelations. But he's talking about the church because the church has lost their first love. And I like this translation because he says, you don't love each other and you don't love me anymore like you used to. Brothers and sisters, we must stimulate passion in our, in our marriages, passion in our marriages. Putting time and attention towards romance in our marriage honors your spouse. Ephesians chapter 2, verse, uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 2 to 4, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace, for there is one body. The one body is this. The two have become one body. You are one body. When the Lord looks at you, he sees him. And when he looks at you, he sees her. God sees you. One body. There is one body. And watch this. There is one spirit, the Holy Spirit that's in the both of you. There's one spirit. And just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. The text says this. The love you had at first is gone. And I don't think there's any marriage, be it a day old or be 15 years old or 50 years old. We know that we have to keep and rekindle the love that we have for one another. How far you've fallen for me. He says, return. He says four things in this text. Remember, return, repent, and repeat. Remember what it used to be. Return to the, to the thoughts of the past that before as you were begin, as you beginning to begin your relationship. Repent because you've gone so far and watch this and then repeat what you know, what you know God's called you to do. Brothers and sisters, as we close out today and let you love birds go out and do what love birds do on this day, <laughs> we want to give you CRCC's passion plan, okay? We got a passion plan for you. So get out your pen and a piece of paper. I want you to take notes about this. This is our passion plan for your Valentine's Day, okay? First of all, first of all, we're going to commit. We are going to reaffirm our commitment to one another. And that's very important that we reaffirm our commitment to one another to let our spouses know I am committed to you and I remain committed to you. Yeah, commitment is the, is the foundation. It's a commitment. It's a covenant. It's an agreement. And we need to reaffirm that. Yes, you're married. Yes, they have a ring on. Yes, you sleep in the same bed. Yes, your, your, your clothes are in the same closet. All that's right. That's cool. But we recommit with our mouths, with our affirmation of one another. Secondly, we remember. Remember. Remember the good. Remember Remember the joy. Remember how it used to be. Remember the times when, when you failed and, and they forgave you. Mm -hmm. It gives you power to forgive them. Remember that forgiveness is a gift to you. Let me tell you this. If you don't let some things go, you will never grow in your marriage. And forgiveness does not let someone off the hook. It lets you off the hook. Consequences will come. Right. Right, and it's important to remember, I love this one, uh, with the remembers, remember the good. It's so easy to remember what someone did to us that was bad, because that's our pride, because we were offended, or it was wrong. But the beauty of remembering the good just brings you closer together. It's like glue, it glues you tighter together, and the more you are intentional about remembering the good, even when you have to discuss something that's weighty, it allows you to discuss it in a different way and not argue when not have strife. Remembering the good is so important. How many of us remember the good that God is to us? Mm -hmm. Okay, then try and remember the good that your spouse is to you. Yeah, and this is something the Lord taught me a long time ago. And, and if, if there has been an offense in your marriage, 
And oftentimes, we like to remember the bad because we want to make sure the person who did the bad to us does not forget, right? I want you to remember what you did to me because if, if I need to remember because you, you're going to forget, so I need to remind you what you did to me. You follow me on this? And this is what I've learned. For the person who has offended somebody, if your spouse, if you have offended your spouse, you need to let them know that I remember what I did to you. I remember it. And watch this. You don't have to remember it because I'll remember. And the more they know you remember, watch this, and that doesn't mean you walk under condemnation, but you change your behavior. I remember the offense. And because I remember it, it will help me not to repeat it. Are you following me on this? How I offended you, I remember it, and let me carry that burden to remember it so that I don't repeat it to free you up to forget it. Are you following me on this? If you remember, they'll forget it. Okay. Because you're taking ownership for it. The next thing is consider the other first. Guard your spouse from negative words. So I'm going to let my husband talk about the negative words part. But consider your spouse first. So I wanted to make you just laugh a little bit. Because this one, when we worked on it, I had to chuckle a little bit. Um, when we were dating, he would drive. And let's say if we drove through the, dro through the drive through and got something to eat, I love a good hot french fry. And so we would buy french fries. And they're good and hot. And so my responsibility, because he was driving, was to feed him while he did the driving. But what I would do, I didn't consider him first. I would eat like four fries and give him one. <laughs> that is the truth, I confess. And it's still the truth. So now when we're in the car, he'll look over and go, how many fries have you had? And so <laughs> this is, there are areas we constantly have to work on with that. So we even have this joke if we go to a restaurant and we're splitting a meal, he will tell the server, go ahead and split it while you're in the kitchen because it's not going to work once you bring it to the table. <laughs> That's the truth. It's okay. True. And so here's the thing, y'all. Consider the other person, and that is not natural. It is not a natural thing. Anybody have a baby here? Does that baby consider how you feel? The baby don't care. The baby doesn't care what you're wearing. They don't care what your day is, what your schedule is. The baby wants your attention right now. But then at some point, the baby's got to grow up. And at some point in our marriages, we got to grow up. The marriage is not for your benefit. The marriage is for the holiness of God, for the glory of God to be seen. So that people can say, how can you last 30-something years? And we can tell them it is the love of Jesus Christ only. It is the power and submission to the Holy Spirit only that keeps a, a man and a woman together in holy matrimony. And every Christian ought to say amen on that. It is that, brothers and sisters. And not only that, we should consider what reaction our action will bring. So we can't make fast decisions. You've got to consider the reaction to your action. If, if I say this, what's going to happen? If I do this, what's going to You cannot be on autopilot. Why? Because we're building something here together. If you build something, you're intentional with everything you do because every word matters in a marriage. And then lastly? Lastly is connect. And not just physical. I know that's uh, a lot of times that's immediately where our mind goes. But it's connecting with eye contact. It is connecting with the hand on the shoulder. It's connecting through our words. Uh, and especially if you have children, this is important that you connect because children can take up so much time that your life becomes revolved. It revolves around the kids. And I'll say this, don't send me an email, don't send me a text. Uh, on this, this is just true. This is one of the beautiful things I was speaking to a lady this week about this, is that one of the things in the midst of this pandemic, so many activities that our kids would be involved in, they've been shut down. And so we have to even think when things open back up, sometimes our kids can run our lives because they're in soccer, they're in this, they're in ballet. You're all over the place, taking them everywhere, but you and your spouse are not connecting. And so this is a wonderful opportunity for us to look at how do we connect as spouses in our relationships. We need to connect. And, and, your, and your children especially, this generation needs to see what a healthy relationship looks like. The television is telling them what a health, healthy relationship looks like. And can I tell you, the television is lying to them what a healthy relationship looks like. It, 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 Hollywood's not going to tell them 
what the Bible is teaching us. And so the Bible, the example that they're going to see is the example in the home where they are. It's going to be the primary example of what a marriage looks like. Yeah, we can bring in the church. They can look at other people in the church. But the most influential person for what married life is will be you and your husband or you and your wife to teach them by your example what marriage looks like. For the next 30 days, remember, two compliments. And don't repeat them, please. I mean, you can repeat them in the next week or something. Come on, be creative. To intentionally... To intentionally compliment your spouse. And if you have a child, it is important you do that in front of them. Let them know, this is my wife. This is my husband. And I love them. And I'm pleased with them. We're going to close out with, uh, with, with the prayer. And just want to say, these will also be on our website this week. In case you didn't write them down or you need to go back and get them, you'll have no excuse. You can go to our website and get those. I would like for all the married ladies, if you would stand, I want to pray with you. And just remember, if you view today and you're here today and you are not married, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to pray for marriages. Remember, God said it was good, and it is, it is his idea. So you want to be prayerful for marriages. If you would, just bow your head and want to pray. Father, we just thank you today. We thank you for this opportunity we have to pray for our marriages, to be taught about our marriages, to hear what your word says about our marriages. And I pray for my sisters that stand with me, that you would give us the spiritual stamina to do what you have called us to do in our marriage. You said that you had given Adam a comparable helper for him, one who would be with him to becoming one, to fulfill destiny and purpose that you had for them as a couple. I pray that my sisters would have eyes to see and ears to hear that they too have been given the task, they've been given the mandate, the calling to fulfill what you want them to do in their marriages. I pray for the places where there needs to be humility, that they would humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. I pray in the places where there needs to be forgiveness, that they would forgive and release the offense to you. I pray in the places where there needs to be tenderness and kindness, that you would move in, our, in my sister's hearts and for all of us to operate in that tenderness and kindness, the fruit of the Spirit evident in our lives and our home. Remind us, Lord, that the Holy Spirit that you gave to each of us as believers is working on the inside. And if we would but yield in those difficult places, we would find the strength and the grace to do what you've called us to do. I pray in the places where we need to submit first to your authority, that we would find submission to be such a beautiful word and that we would submit to you, trusting you to work out some details that we lay before you in our marriages that would motivate our spouse, our husbands, to be the men that you're calling them to be, or whatever it is that we feel like we're missing in the marriage, we would trust you. We would submit to your lordship. I pray, Lord, you give us giant size ears to hear what you're saying to us as you grow us as your daughters, that as women around us, whether we're at work, where, wherever we are with our children, that we will be able to encourage other women around and our, our children that marriage is good. We thank you for what you are doing. We thank you for the years you sustained us. And we're trusting you to move us on day by day, that your glory would be revealed in our houses, Lord, in our homes, love would abound. And where we join in with the Apostle Paul, where we're weak, we rely on your strength to make us strong. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Sisters, be, please be seated. I'm going to ask every husband here, would you stand? And even online, you may be watching in your living room, wherever you are. I want you to stand in your home. And brothers, before we pray, 
I'm going to ask you to do a simple gesture, two things. I'm going to ask you first to hold your hands out like this, because that's a posture of receiving. And then in a minute, I'm going to ask you to flip your hands in a posture of giving. Okay, so first, a posture of receiving. Father, today, we husbands, we stand. And Lord, we open our hands that you would that you would teach us. Father, we're open to the Spirit. We're open to, to your design for this marriage. And Lord, today with hands open, hearts open today, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us. Lord, today we open our hands that they might be used to build and not to destroy. Father, today we pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts would really be acceptable in your sight because you are our strength and you are our redeemer. Lord, we open our hands that you would provide. and We open our hands in a gesture to say that we cannot do this alone because the task that you've given to us is to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And what a great love you have for your church. We can't do this alone. Teach us to love unconditionally, to forgive. Teach us, Lord, that although we may be rejected, but we would always pursue as you do with your church. Teach us, Lord. We open our hands. For the children that you've trusted some of us with, Lord, we don't know how to raise a boy or a girl unless you teach us how to teach, to raise a boy or a girl. So, Lord, we open our hands. Teach us to raise our boys to be men of integrity, our girls to be girls of integrity, Lord. Teach us to love our household. Teach us, Lord that we would love our children. They would know above all things that their father loves them because it sets up a way for them to understand your eternal love for them. Lord, you call us fathers and you are our heavenly father. Teach us to be a father. And our brothers, if you would just flip your hands over in the posture of giving. Lord, today, use these hands to bless, first of all, our spouse. May our wives know that they are more than enough. May they know that they satisfy more than enough. May they know that they have our undying love for them, just as we have your undying love for us. Lord, use these hands now to bless. Lord, today we ask that where there has been harm in this marriage, by our own hands, that you would bring healing today. Father, today we thank you that you trusted us with your daughter. And may we love them. Thank you for the honor and great treasure you've given to us and your daughter. Lord, today use these hands to bless and never condemn. And may these hands never bring physical harm to our spouse, to our wives. May they know regardless of how angry we may be or disappointed we may be, we will never use our hands to harm your daughter. Father, today, where there are children in the marriage, I pray, brother, wherever you are, put your hands on your son, your daughter, and speak a blessing over them because God has given you that authority, Lord. Right now, wherever you are, maybe in this building, maybe watch it right now, take the time right now, this moment. Don't do it later, do it now. Put your hand on your girl. Put your hand on your boy and say, this is my daughter and I love you. You're my son and I love you. And I will always accept you. I'll never reject you. Father, today, you trust us to build a home that you might receive glory, Lord, today. And we pray that you might be glorified. 
you be the center of this home. You be the center of our lives. And Lord, we take the authority that Joshua gave to us and we declare as for me in this house, it's not about our neighbor, it's not about our government, it's not about the influencer that we may see on social media. We declare as the authority of this house, for me and this house, the people in this house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to submit to your spirit and we're going to submit to your holy scripture. In this house, it will be a tabernacle of your presence. We have that authority. We claim that authority right now and we declare it to be so in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit and all the church said, amen, amen. God bless you. Would you stand? All right. Father, we thank you today for what we've heard, Lord, today. I pray that we would put these things into practice. I pray, Lord Jesus, today for a spirit of humility to be in every home today. Use our words, Lord Jesus. Give us words to complement each other for the next 30 days. Be committed. Two times a day, I will find a reason and, and, and justification to give you a full-throated compliment because I love you. And Lord, may that bring, bear fruit in our marriages. For those, Lord Jesus, who are not married or maybe going through strife in their marriage, I pray, Lord Jesus, for hope. I pray that they would know there is eternal hope in Jesus. Lord, we pray for reconciliation. We pray for redemption, Lord Jesus. And for those who are looking for a spouse, Lord, we pray that they would not be weary, but they would trust you. And they would not be anxious, but they would trust you. And let your will be done. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he strengthen us with power through his spirit in our inner beings so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. I pray we've been rooted, grounded in his love, may have power together with all God's people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep the love of Christ is for us. And to know this love that surpasses the ability to comprehend that we might be filled to the fullness of the measure of God in our lives. And now to this great God, he is still able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine. To him be the glory and the majesty, the dominion and power. Forever and ever we pray, those who love Jesus said, amen, amen. God bless you.